Hello and welcome to my KringleCon talk, Reversing Crypto the Easy Way. My name is Ron Bose, otherwise known online as JagoXA6. You can find me on Twitter, on GitHub, on all kinds of platforms with that handle. I am one of the Holiday Hack Challenge, Challenge and in Infrastructure Developers. This is gonna be my third year doing Holiday Hack Challenge stuff, and it's gonna be our biggest and best ever. Last year, I wrote a blog on a sense pen test blog, kind of outlining the techniques you need for one of my challenges. This year, I decided to do a video instead. I've done lots of talks at conferences, and this is my first time ever recording a video. So I feel like I really need the feedback of an audience. So I've set up a little laugh track here that will play laughs in tune with how good my jokes are. So, okay, we won't be using that. Never mind, never mind. <clears throat> okay. So if you want to read my blog, go to skullsecurity.org. My blog talks about crypto, talks about reversing, talks about all kinds of the same stuff we're gonna talk about here. And just like here, we're gonna try and make it very approachable, not just math. So <clears throat> to introduce this talk, this will be an introduction to reverse engineering cryptographic code. That's a mouthful and it sounds really scary, but don't run away. It's not as bad as it sounds. This is targeted towards anybody with a working knowledge of pen testing, of programming, stuff like that. Also, this talk might help you with one of this year's Holiday Hack Challenge challenges, just maybe. <clears throat> so why did I write this talk? And why did I write the Associate Challenge? Well, I've been doing reverse, or I've been doing pen testing for years now, two years at CounterHack and a lot longer elsewhere. While doing pen tests, my focus is often on applications and including web applications, desktop stuff, server stuff, whatever. That frequently means I run into unknown programs that do unknown things that have to reverse engineer. And there are very often really good findings from that kind of thing. So I really wanted to write a talk that would talk about some of the easy ways to do this, ways that aren't gonna be days and days of reversing some cryptographic mathematical thing. For example, like let's say an application outputs a 128-bit hash. You could spend hours looking at the, the assembly and machine code that generates the hash and eventually figure out that it's MD5 based on the algorithms. Or you can just think 128 bits, that's the size of MD5, and just test it. And frequently, that just works. So I want to talk about places where that will work pretty much transparently. But before I talk about the actual crypto, let's talk about the tools we're going to use. So for the reverse engineering side, I use IDA, the Interactive Disassembler. We'll be using that for all of our examples because it's what I know best. It's what I've always used. The link here, and I will be publishing these slides afterwards, so I'll send you the link. This link will get you the free version of IDA, which is, it's out of date. It's not, it doesn't have all the support you need, but has everything you need for, the, for this presentation to follow along. There's also a completely free tool called Gidra or Gydra from the NSA. It's linked there. I've heard great things. I've never used it, so I can't judge it myself. But it's pretty good. On the uh, coding side, I'll be using two tools for the examples. Uh, Microsoft Visual Studio 2008. That's right, you heard right, 2008. Back 10 years ago, I was at a conference for Microsoft and got a free copy. And free is free, so I still use it. I'll also be using Ruby 2.4 with IRB, which is the interactive Ruby. It looks like this, um, I, IRB, and you can run commands. So it's just a simple Ruby uh, thing. I'm specifically using Ruby 2.4. It shouldn't matter what version you use. Any version, pretty much any version at all will actually work. There's a link here to the KringleCon uh, slides. Um, this link will also be at the end, so don't worry about having to write it down. Or Pause the video, I guess. <clears throat> so let's start our journey into crypto talking about keys, aka where things start to go wrong. So we're going to focus for this talk on symmetric keys because they're simpler and because they're more common, at least in my experience. Um, public key crypto has its own issues, but they tend to be more complex and they tend to be more difficult to understand. So I want to focus just on symmetric keys, where the encryption and decryption are the same. The biggest thing that we're going to talk about is the last line on the slide, which is keys must remain confidential. And to be confidential, 
they also have to be unpredictable because if you can predict it, then it's not confidential anymore. So we will see how keys are misused in various ways. And the next section will be on random number generation where keys are generated in bad ways. So first of all, how do you recognize a key? You're looking at an application, either in you know, C, Python, Ruby, Assembly, Rust, whatever you want, and you see code. What, what's a key look like? So we will see an example in about two slides, but normally a key is a fixed length, depending on the algorithm being used, and we'll talk about algorithms you know, two sections from now. If it's seven or eight bytes, it's probably DES. DES uses seven bytes or 56 bits for a key, and then one byte or eight bits as a parity. So you might see seven or eight, depending on how it's being used. You're gonna see 16, 24, or 32 byte keys for AES. And we'll talk about recognizing these two ciphers later, but the majority of block ciphers you see will be DES or AES. Um, we'll, we'll talk about that later. Keys will look random and should be random because it's not good enough to just look random. We will talk about randomness as well. And third, the key will be shared somehow, meaning that when you encrypt a file, a key is hopefully generated, and when you decrypt a file, it is used, which means the key must be hard-coded, which is bad, stored somewhere, which could be bad, transmitted, which could be bad, escrowed, maybe bad. Um, somehow the key must be shared. Very typical is just a password file or sorry, a password derived key where both people transmit a password to each other and then both use a password, such as encrypted zip file. But how do you generate keys? Keys should come from secure random functions such as crypt gen random on Windows or get random on Linux. Let's dive into those two functions a little bit. I'm gonna bring up my Windows machine here. We're gonna search for crypt gen random. Also, Googling function names is something that I wind up doing an, an awful lot while pen testing or while reviewing applications. So if you search this, first of all, it's deprecated, so there's that. But what you're going to want to look for is the cryptogen function fills a buffer with cryptographically random bytes. Cryptographically random is what you want to see. I will switch to my Linux VM, and we'll do the same thing. We'll look at gen random, gen or get random rather. So get random obtains a series of random bytes. Um, if you read through this, you will eventually see somewhere in here, um, these bytes can be used for cryptographic purposes. That's what we want to see. We don't want to see non-cryptographic keys. In contrast, if we just look for rand, um, it's a pseudo random number generator. And what you're going to see somewhere in here is that um, this is insecure and I don't want to spend all the time reading a man page, but you will see yeah, this function will be a weak random number generator. That means don't use this for crypto. And if we scroll down, we'll actually see the algorithm this uses, which is this. And uh, we will talk more about the algorithms later. So keys, as I said, should be generated from secure random functions. Keys are often generated from non-secure random functions, such as um, rand, like I said, uh, time, get to count, stuff like that. The example at the bottom of the slide is from some software I actually had to uh, work with. And you can see it's using math.random, which is JavaScript, in order to calculate a random, a random stream. That's not good. That can be predicted. So when you're trying to evaluate how keys are being used, look for these easy to find flaws. Are the keys hard-coded? We're going to say a demo about that. Are they securely generated? We'll, we'll say a demo about that. And are they shared securely? We're not going to have a demo, but that's something to keep an eye on. So let's do two demos back to back. One on hard-coded keys and one on a bad key generator. So these demos will be on Windows. We'll have some on both OSs. <clears throat> so for the hard-coded key, let's start by looking at the C version of this code. So this is a very simple C function. It doesn't actually do crypto because that's sort of beyond the scope of this demo. But what you're going to see is a main function that just calls do ecrypt with a static string. This is a data string, nothing too fancy. The do encrypt function calls do AES, 
it passes a key parameter and a text parameter. The text parameter comes from main. The key parameter comes from a hard-coded key. That's bad. And for what it's worth, this is what a key looks like. F0, A9, A8. The black slash X is just, you know, that's X character. If you count these bytes, where each byte is slash X, F0, for example, you will find that there are 16 bytes in the string, and 16 bytes is how many bytes there are at AES. So if you ever see a 16 byte key, you can take a pretty educated guess that you're looking at AES. It also helps me see if I'm going to call it do AES, but function names can lie. Um, the old Battle.net code for StarCraft used to have a SHA-1 function that didn't actually do SHA-1. It tried to, but there was a bug. That's a whole other story, though. So obviously the code does nothing, so I'm not going to run it, but we are going to look at it in IDA. So if you were to open this file in IDA and just click next, next, next through all the dialogues, you will see something like this. I might have scrolled, but I haven't changed anything. On the left, we see a main function. So let's start there. <clears throat> There's a lot of weird code. Uh, push EP, move EP, all this stuff. We're going to ignore all this. You don't really need to know how this works for this example. And I don't want to overwhelm you with talking about how like call stacks work and all that stuff. What we're going to focus on is where we see English words primarily. So for example, call do encrypt. That sounds like a call stuff function called do encrypt. And as we know that the parameter to do encrypt is a static text string, which is a previous line, push text. This is a data string. So from this, you can conclude, and I can confirm, that parameters are pushed and that functions are called. The only other thing to know is that functions return values by putting them in, a, in EAX, but I don't even think we need to know that for these examples. So let's just double click on do encrypt and see what that does. So immediately we see do AES. So now we know that it does AES. It passes two parameters. The first parameter, which is the closest one to the call, is a key. The second parameter is EAX. If we look where EAX comes from, it comes from text, and text is a parameter. So it calls do AES with the parameter, which is our string, and with a variable called key. Now, what you're going to want to know is what's, where does this key come from? And often that can be tricky to find. In our case, we click on it, and hey, look, there's the key. This is where the laugh track would play, you know. <clears throat> so if we if we were doing this without seeing the code first, we would see the key as one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, 16 bytes. And again, 16 bytes means we're probably looking at AES 128. And that's pretty much all there is to this example. <clears throat> the next example we're gonna look at is bad key generation, bad RNG. And all these examples will be published on GitHub, by the way. So you can run these yourself. So for this example, we're actually going to run the program. So let's run demos. What are we in demos? Demo2 slash uh, the exe file. So we run that. It's just going to generate a key. Nothing is done with the key, purely a toy example. If we run it again, different key, run it again, different key, etc. But what's going to be interesting, and this is something to really look out for, because this is your first sign that something is going wrong with the encryption, is if you run it twice quickly, you get the same key, AEE9, AEE9. Uh-oh. If I run it lots of times, what you're going to see, and I don't know how good the frame rate is, but the key changes roughly once per second, which means the key is probably based on the current time. That's a huge red flag. Key should never be based on the time. They should be based on completely random entropy that can't be predicted by any reasonable person. So let's keep that in mind and look at the uh, source code. The source code, the main function is identical. We call do encrypt on a static string. The do encrypt function, the first half is a key gen. The second half is just printing it. You can ignore the second half. So for the key gen, we declare a variable to hold the key, 16 bytes. We call srand, which is the seed for the random number generator with the current time. The current time is predictable. I know what time it is. It's November, it's, hey, it's 3.33 p.m. So that's predictable. Then we loop 16 times and each loop we call rand. Well, we know what rand does. We just saw the code for that over on the, uh, over right here. This is a Linux version. We're using the Windows version, but it's effectively the same. It takes the seed, multiplies by number, 
as another number and returns it. That's literally it. If, if the seed is the current time, then we can just multiply the current time by this and this, and we have the code. Now, what does this look like in assembly? Well, we're going to open up the uh, IDA file. Just like before, this is completely uh, fresh. We've got a main. The main function is identical. It pushes the text. It calls do encrypt. Now, do encrypt has a bunch of stuff up here involving security cookie. We're just going to ignore all that because all we want to see is the really simple things. Uh, it calls time, and then time returns its return value in EAX. Then it uses EAX as a parameter to srend. That means it has to seed to the random number generator, random number generator to the current time. Then stuff happens, stuff happens, stuff. Oh, hey, look, there is rend. We see a little loop here. Um, the bottom jumps to the top. It does a bunch of loopy stuff, and it calls random each loop. If you spend a little bit of time, you'll see it's looping 16 times, and each loop is getting one random byte. So immediately we can see that the, from observing the application, we see the key only changes once per second. Then from looking at this, we see it's based on time and it's based on rand. So you know that if you can figure out how rand works, which is documented, you can reverse this encryption. So don't do that <clears throat> if you're programming. So I've talked a lot about random, and I've showed you random algorithms a little bit. Let's dive into those a little bit deeper. So I've sort of referred to the term PRNG, or pseudo random number generator, a few times. A PRNG generates random-ish numbers, and random-ish numbers are only good for security if you want a secure-ish system. If you want a good key, we need better, and I've already talked about those better functions. But let's say we're evaluating code. How do we recognize a bad PRNG? So one PRNG is called a linear congruential generator. Um, I put a link to uh, Rosetta code here, which has implementations in every language you could possibly imagine. Um, a linear congruential generator is a fancy name for very simple code. And in fact, this is code that we've already seen. Um, when you call SRAND, it sets a seed. When you call RAND, it multiplies and adds the seed, and then this end shrinks it down to a smaller value. So almost all the RAND you use for stuff uses either an LCG like this or a Mersenne twister, which we're gonna see a little bit later. One thing that those two and most other pseudo RNGs have in common is that you start with a seed and the seed has math happen to it. How does how does math get inflicted on a seed? Well, that depends on the generator, but we're not gonna worry too much about that. We're just gonna use our old friend Google. If we were to pump that constant 11035 into Google, the first result says, hey, look, this is an LCG. That was easy. Now we don't need to reverse engineer the code. We know exactly what it is, and we can find 100 implementations on Rosetta code. Simple. So now, Let's look at a different type of RNG as a demo. So this will be demo three, <clears throat> an unknown RNG. So this will give you a little bit of coding. So let's start again by running the code. Demo three slash unknown RNG. So what we're gonna see, I print out the seed, which most crypto software doesn't print the seed. This is just to make it easier to understand. And then we generate the key. So if we run it quickly, we're gonna see it doesn't have the same thing twice, the same way it did before. A big secret is if you run this one even more quickly, like twice per millisecond, it will. But we'll see why in a bit. <clears throat> so let's say we want to generate this key. So let's pick this one, for example. We have our seed and we have our key. So how does this work? Well, we're not going to look at the, uh, <clears throat> at the CPP file because that's too easy. That has comments. We're instead going to look straight at our IDA file. <clears throat> so once again, Let's go to main and scroll. So immediately we see get tick count. In case you haven't heard of get tick count, we're going to copy it. We're going to paste it. Remember I said earlier that I do a lot of Googling. Get tick count function. <clears throat> um, retrieves the number of milliseconds that elapsed since the system was started. 
sounds simple enough. Um, is this as, as bad as using the current time? No. Is this good? No. This is not good. This is still really, really bad because we can take a pretty good guess when computers have started. And at worst, it's only got a resolution of 50 days. So you can predict this. You don't ever want to use this for cryptographic purposes. In fact, if you're ever seeding a random function, you probably don't want to use that for cryptographic purposes, period. Then we call my srand, we print the seed, and then we print we call my rand. Let's take a look at my srand. My srand is actually somewhat complicated. It does stuff. It compares a value to 15f, which is hex 351 in decimal. It multiplies by 1c8 whatever, which is 299 in decimal, and so on and so on. So it's it's short but does some math. Let's keep this value in mind. Because it might come in handy. Wink. <clears throat> then let's look at the rand function. Rand is a little more complex. There's a lot going on. There's some constants. This would be really scary to reverse. There's n, there's xor, there's shifts, there's or, there's moves, there's, there's all kinds of stuff going on. And it goes on and on. So if we had to, we could reverse this function. It's just not fun. So let's do this the easy way by looking at the srand copying that constant and pasting it into Google. If you paste it into Google, oh, hey, look, the second result is called random.c. Hey, look at that. A code for a random number generator. Specifically, this is a Mersenne twister. So we're gonna copy this code. We're gonna paste this into my solution skeleton, which is, this might actually be the solution. Let me take a look. Oh, good. This is an empty solution. This solution has a my srand and my rand function. So let's just uh, paste the whole block here. I'm going to make a couple small changes because this was uh, designed for something else. So set seed and gen random are our functions. Rand mask isn't defined, so we're going to use one byte. If you would look at the code, you would find the 0xff at the end of uh, rand. I'll delete my srand and my rand. Uh, my srand is going to become set seed. Our seed is this value. There we go. And then at each loop, it's going to call my rand. We're going to change that to gen random. Then compile, run. Our output is e3662f. In our original one, it was E3662F. So we just generated the same cryptographic key in big quotation marks by simply understanding the, the random number generator and guessing the seed. So very simple. I should not have closed that uh, command prompt. Uh, e So there we go. We identified and we're able to break the, the PRNG. Now you might think this is a toy example, but this literal attack with this literal same process worked exactly like that for a project I worked on. So this actual attack has come up in a uh, pen test before. So now we've talked about, about keys where things start to go wrong and RNGs where things continue going wrong. Now we're going to talk about crypto itself where things really go wrong. <clears throat> so when you actually start looking at crypto, you're going to want to know two things. Well, initially two things. We already talked about keys. So in this case, we want to know what algorithm is being used and what mode is it being used in. And then what is a mode? We'll talk about that. Now remember, we're doing this the easy way. We're going to Google constants. We're going to look at lengths of things. We're not going to like reverse mathematical stuff. Not, not that. So what I do if I run into a situation where I can encrypt arbitrary text and I want to know how the crypto works, whether it's being done locally or remotely, I just encrypt the letter A and then AA and then AAA and so on. It's not just A because I'm Canadian, A. It's A because it's something. It doesn't have to be A. 
I just like A. But the pattern of how the output changes based on the input changes tells you everything you need to know about algorithms and key sizes and sorry, algorithms and modes and everything else. So we're going to do a quick demo of recognizing ciphers based on block size. I already talked a little bit about how AES is, has a 128-bit key, but now let's talk about the size of blocks and what a block is, in fact. So we're going to run IRB to get in the Ruby tool. And we're going to uh, copy and paste code from another document I've opened. Basically, we're going to implement three very simple crypto with one single same key. We're going to use RC4, which is a, a really bad stream cipher. We're going to use DES, which is a really bad block cipher. And we're going to use AES, which is a really good block cipher being used badly. Then we are going to uh, take another piece of code that I've pre-written and basically encrypt. So let's, let's start by doing this by hand rather than using the code that I uh, put here. So if we run RC4, of some string, we get an output that's some string. And if we change the string that's that's going in, the string that goes out changes. And we're curious how that string changes. DES will be the same thing. Depending on the uh, string in, the output string changes. So here you go. Now what's interesting about DES is if we have one character, it outputs eight bytes. If we have two characters, it outputs eight bytes. If we have seven characters, eight bytes. If we have eight characters, there's 16 bytes. If we have 24 characters, it's 32 bytes. What we're seeing here is what's called a block cipher, which means all work is done in blocks. So let's uh, find that code that I just had. <clears throat> copy paste. So for RC4, let's encrypt everything from 1 to 40 bytes long, and then just print the length. So if we encrypt 1 byte, the output's 1 byte. 2 bytes is 2 bytes. 3 bytes is... You see where this is going. Let's try the same thing with this. Let's just add bytes here. So when we have DES, 1 byte in is 8 bytes, 2 is 8, 3 is 8, 4 is 8, 5 is 8, and so on. You'll see 8, 16, 24, 32, 40, 48, and so on. The reason is it only ever operates in blocks of eight bytes. And as soon as you get to the eighth byte, it does eight more bytes. If we do AES, we're gonna see roughly the same pattern, only 16 bytes, 32 bytes, 48 bytes, and so on. That's because DES uses eight byte blocks. AES uses 16 byte blocks. So, Here's a summary of what I just said. If you see one byte blocks, it's probably a stream cipher. So look at RC4 or Salsa20 or a block cipher in CTR mode. Unfortunately, it's kind of hard to tell. However, if you see eight byte blocks and the key is seven or eight bytes long, it's almost certainly DES. If you see 16 byte blocks and the keys are 16, 24, or 32 bytes, it's probably AES. AES has AES has one block size, which is 16, and three key sizes, which is 16, 24, or 32. So keep that in mind. Other than ciphers, we're going to talk about modes of operation. First of all, what is a mode? So a block cipher encrypts each block individually. The question is, how do those blocks connect with each other to form a full cipher text? Um, the simplest concept is ECB, which is electronic codebook where the plain text and key go into a block cipher algorithm, which is AES or DES or many, many others, and out pops cipher text. Then the next block of plain text goes in, the key goes in, cipher text comes out, the third block goes in. This means that each block of plain text and each block of cipher text is independent from every other. The same key and the same plain text will generate the same cipher text, which is a problem. The famous example of why this is a problem is encrypting the Linux tux symbol. So the original image looks like a penguin. The ECB encrypted image looks like a very weird penguin. The CBC encrypted image, which we will see shortly, is purely random looking. 
<clears throat> and honestly, ECB and CBC are the vast majority of the encryption that I actually see. And AES and DES are the vast majority of algorithms. I did a very special one this year for a reverse encrypt the easy way presentation. I took the entire first page of this presentation and encrypted the bitmap with, I believe this is with DES, and this is what it looks like in ECB mode. If I was to use CBC mode, which we'll talk about next slide, it would look completely random. Hey, look, CBC mode. So in CBC, each block depends on the ciphertext that comes before it. What's that mean? It means we start with a plain text and an IV. The IV we're not going to worry much about. The plain text and the key go into the encryption box and out comes a first block of ciphertext. Then that ciphertext is mixed with the plain text. It's encrypted, out comes ciphertext. That ciphertext and plain text are, and so on. So each, each plain text is mixed with the previous ciphertext. This leads to some problems. Uh, you may have heard of pending oracle attacks, which I talk about in my blog, we're not going to talk about here. Uh, these happen because of this mixing. So it's not always good, but this is the most common way people use encryption. So as I said, you'll almost always see ECB or CBC. Um, good judgment is typically to use CTR mode, but if you're actually implementing crypto rather than breaking crypto, you might want to check a talk that's not about breaking crypto. So. Let's do a demo on that. So I use the same application. I copy a new piece of code. This new code simply has two different uh, functions. One is ECB, which just encrypts your data with ECB, and then pops out the blocks and makes them printable, which is what all the extra code is. Uh, the CBC one does the same thing. It encrypts with DES CBC and outputs the blocks. So let's run. Let's do ECB of AAAA. We're going to see. It outputs one block. Six bytes, one block. Seven bytes, one block. Eight bytes, we'll output two blocks. If we do, I don't know how many bytes, we're going to get five blocks. Now, what we can notice here is that the first, second, third, and fourth blocks are absolutely identical. This is because each A eight times encrypts the same thing. How could it not when it doesn't have any other dependencies? If we change the first byte, we're going to see the first block changes, the second, third, and fourth don't. If we change the last block, we'll see the last block changes, but again, the middle ones stay the same. This is basically guaranteed to be ECB, electronic code book encrypted mode, if you see this behavior. CBC, on the other hand, if we encrypt one byte, four bytes, you'll notice that the four bytes are the same as ECB because we only have one block so far. Eight bytes, we're going to see the same thing as ECB so far, roughly. But if we get a bunch of blocks, uh, it looks like about six blocks, you'll see that even though the blocks are the same, the output is different. This means that there's less patterns, which is a good thing. If we change the first block, everything changes, not just the first block. If we change the last block, only the last block changes, nothing before it does. This tells you that it's CBC. If you can perform this experiment, and see either of these two behaviors, you know what you're looking at. If you see any other behavior, then it's not, it's not ECB, or it's not CBC, or it's using an IV for CBC, which means if you change the same thing twice, it'll be different, whereas when we do it now, it's the same. So that's how you can get a very easy victory identifying crypto algorithms. So some common problems with crypto modes. ECB is worthless. There are patterns, there are attacks, there's block reshop, there's all kinds of attacks against it. Don't ever use ECB. Uh, CBC with no IV is bad. We just saw how you put the same thing twice, you get the same output, that's not a good sign. Um, if you encrypt with the same key and same IV more than once, or if you can force an application to, that's bad. You lose all security guarantees. So we're gonna talk a little bit about Windows. Windows is a theoretical zero point of things going wrong. It is as wrong as they get. So on Windows, doing anything requires a complex series of well-documented API calls. And by well-documented, I mean it's easy to find out what they do. It's hard to actually use them. It is really, really, really hard to, fit, to actually use them. So for example, to import a key and encrypt data, you'll almost certainly see the functions crypt acquire context, crypt import key, and crypt encrypt next to each other. 
if you uh, if is doing a web application functionality, so if it's using like a uh, web API, you're going to see Internet Open, Internet Connect, HTTP Open Request, HTTP Read Data, um, and so on. Very common requests. Um, I spend a lot of time reversing Windows apps, and frequently I just go through a list of of the API calls, Google each one I don't know, and figure out what they do. The A on the end of each of these functions, again, not because I'm Canadian, A just means ASCII as opposed to Unicode. There are W versions for wide, crypt acquire index W, crypt import key W, they just, they just use Unicode, otherwise they're the same. So we're gonna do a pretty quick demo because this isn't really a crypto one now, this is a, uh, a web application. So close, don't save, don't save. <clears throat> All right, so let's uh, go to demo number six. So a few months ago, maybe even a year ago, I released a vulnerability in WebEx service. And we're not gonna talk about the vulnerability. Go to webexact.org to find the vulnerability. But I thought this was a good example of, of uh, learning, learning Windows functions via API calls. So if you were to look at this, if you look at the uh, WebEx service client on the older version, it might still be the same in the newer version. I haven't looked at it. Uh, what I was really interested in was the import create process as user. Create process as user creates a process with a particular user token. And you can see that this function is called and all the parameters are commented with what they actually are. So if you want to understand the context of how this is being called, we have to rewind to the top of the function. So let's just scroll up and up and up. So now, when this function starts, you're gonna see security cookie like before. You're gonna see some XL writing and some other stuff. Don't, don't really care. The first API call you see is create, create tool help 32 snapshot, which was actually one of the first Windows APIs I ever learned when I was a young, young hacker. If you Google that, you're gonna find the documentation for it. It says, it takes a snapshot of the specified processes as well as use modules and threads. Okay, not much to go on there, but if we look at the values, um, you'll be able to figure out what this is doing. We're not gonna go too much. Then there's error handling, there's error handling. Then we see process 32 first. What's that do? We're gonna copy it, we're gonna paste it, we're gonna click on the result, and we're gonna see retrieves information about the first process in a snapshot. And hey, that snapshot is what we just saw happen. Um, the first parameter is the handle return from create tool help 32 snapshot, look at that. And then LPPE is a pointer to sunstruct. All right, scroll, 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 what's next? We see WCSICMP, let's Google that. It's a string compare just performs a case insensitive comparison of strings. All right, one string is winlogon.exe, it's hard-coded, and one string, we don't know, but we can probably guess it came from the previous function, which is the first process. So we can conclude just based on reasoning that it's checking if the first process is winlogon. If it is, it continues down. If it's not, the loop starts over. Then we're gonna see process ID to session ID we're going to copy that, we're going to paste it, and we're going to learn that, well, it converts a uh, process ID to a session ID. Then process 32 next goes to the next one. What this loop does is finds the process ID of when log on the exe. That's all. If you were to reverse the whole loop, that's all it's doing. Once it finds it, it calls open process. What does open process do? Open process opens a local process object. Not that helpful, but we can, I can explain that it basically gets a handle to a running process. In this case, we can guess that's when log on that H. Then we get open process token. If we Google it, that retrieves the token associated with the process. Duplicate token creates a new copy of the token that we can use. Then create process as user, creates a process as a user given a token. The token obviously comes from the duplicate token, which comes from the open process token, which comes from WinLogon, which runs as system. So in only a couple of minutes of simply reasoning, 
we can guess that create process as user creates a process as the same user as when log on or system, which turned out to be a huge privilege escalation and remote sort of code execution vulnerability. And we figure all that out just based on following, following the uh, API calls. Very nice. <clears throat> all right. So from our last section, putting it all together, otherwise known as let's watch it go wrong. In this, we're going to put everything together, cracking an encrypted message by identifying a key generation and the algorithm. So we're basically going to take an unknown application that generates a key to encrypt a message. And we're going to use all the techniques we just talked about to figure out how and then break it. All right. <clears throat> so let's close all these windows. Let's go to demo seven. So demo seven actually implemented as a Ruby solution. So <clears throat> first of all, before we actually start trying to solve it, let's take a look at the uh, at what the application is doing. So demo seven exe, we run it, it asks for data. All right, let's give it just A. So if we give it A, we have an input of 16 bytes. We have a key, we have a timestamp that I just printed for convenience. We have a key that's 16 bytes and we have an output that's 16 bytes. If we have two A's, same thing, three A's, same thing, four A's, same thing. If we have five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 15, 14, 15 A's, same thing. 16 A's, the output doubles to 32 bytes. So what we talked about, we know that if a key is 16 bytes, it's probably AES-128. If it's AES-128, the output should be in 16 byte blocks, and it is, so that's good. So let's, instead of encrypting this, let's encrypt this, it is a test message. So, it encrypts 32 bytes, and we're going to try to break this now. So as I mentioned before, if you encrypt the same thing multiple times quickly, you might start seeing a pattern where, let's see, get two next to each other, where the timestamp is the same, the same, they're encrypted the same second, you'll get the same key, A9 to, to E, A9 to E, and the same output, F8, FD, F8, FD. Okay, so as we mentioned, if we encrypt using a timestamp, we're going to wind up with collisions just like this. So now we know that the RNG is probably seated with the current time. All right, we're making good progress. Now let's uh, open it up in IDA. All right, so in the main function, you can see the error string usage. We saw that earlier. Then you see an L file in data and encrypt. That's all we really see in main. So let's see what encrypt does. Encrypt does weird cookie stuff. It does a bunch of moving variables around. It does a malloc. It does memset. It does other stuff. It does a mem copy. Um, so the first thing you see is crypt acquire context. I mentioned that this is the first function used when encrypting data on Windows. We also have a crypto provider, Microsoft Enhanced RSA and AES provider. If you Google that string and you Google crypt acquire context, you will get a lot of information about a very limited number of algorithms this might be using. Then we see make key. Make key is going to presumably create a key. And then it's going to print the key, and then it's going to do some encryption down here. So let's take a look at make key. Make key calls time, just like we talked about. Um, it prints a timestamp, and then it calls my srand, and then it calls my rand 16 times. Let's see what my srand looks like. It's a lot simpler than our last example. It simply stores the seed in a variable called state. Not much. All right. Let's look at my rand. My rand is also very simple. It does a multiply, it does an addition, it does an end. This is already in decimal, but if we wanted to, we can convert between hex and decimal. We can copy this and we can paste this into our uh, browser and say, what is this? Oh, hey, look, why is this variable, variable used in rand? And it's an LCG, just like we talked about. If we were to scroll down, we're going to find rosettacode.org has, has this code. And we're going to scroll down and look at the Ruby implementation because we're going to write this exploit in Ruby. 
the Ruby implementation simply has a uh, srand function and a rand function. There are two different rand functions. One is the Berkeley and one is the Microsoft. The key we see is 110351524, and that is the Microsoft one. So we're just going to copy this function altogether. Now I'm going to switch windows back to this. So we have everything we need now. I'm going to switch to my Ruby. Uh, let's see, demos, demo seven. We're going to run, we're going to edit demo seven solution skeleton. All right, so this is basically a skeleton that I put together. First of all, a bunch of to do's. The key length variable, you know, 16 bytes. The key generation is going to be where we implement our random. So I'm going to paste in the random code. I think I might actually need to uh, uh, copy out my V, I'm appears to be broken, which is concerning. What if I copy the timestamp? All right, I can copy out my VM. We're gonna, we're gonna have to do this a little bit differently. <clears throat> we're just gonna copy this to a file. Uh, copy to a file, new text file, uh, random.txt, paste, save. All right, and then we'll also uh, grab the, uh, the random number generator again. Oops, there you have it open. I'm not going to get Windows. All right, so grab the RNG, go back to the uh, folder. There we go. All right, save that. Now we can do this all uh, on Linux. All right, there we go. All right, so ignoring the uh, bad new lines, we have our timestamp and everything else. So we're going to grab our, our RNG. We're just going to use instead of R, we're going to use seed equals all of that. And then we can do key plus equals. Do that. There. So this just generates the sequence of random bytes that we that we would be generating and converts each one to a character and adds that to the key. So there's a generate key function. Now we have a decrypt function. So for decrypt, we have to pick the algorithm. We figure out AES and the details of the algorithm. It's AES-128. We know that because we did, uh, <clears throat> we uh, saw the key is 120, or is uh, 16 bytes long. And then the mode. <clears throat> so now all we need is our seed, which is gonna be the first argument. We're just gonna hard code this since we have it handy here. So there's our seed. Seed equals that. And we need our data. Data equals that. Data equals that. And we're gonna do this is in hex, we actually need to be in binary, so we're gonna do pack h star. If you're curious about these uh, conventions like this, I talked about this in my blog. I don't want to go too much into detail of how you do this. In Ruby because it's just it's complicated, unnecessarily complicated for this talk. So we're going to generate a key, we're going to print the key, and we're going to decrypt the text. Just for fun, let's uh, also print the expected key. So puts uh, expected key that. Here we go. If I run this, the, uh, this script, what we should see, it wants the two parameters. I'll just get rid of that code. It's going to get 
Um, the expected key is A92EC, the generated key is A92EC, and the decrypted is, this is a test message. So despite not being able to copy from IBM, and despite being a little bit troublesome, I was able to reverse this in about five minutes, maybe less. And I've literally done this exact same sequence for other uses as well. All right, so conclusion, where things finally stopped going wrong. So hopefully you learned a few new things, such as how to quickly identify crypto keys, how to identify algorithms and modes of operation, and how to quickly find cryptographic code. That was the kind of goal of the talk. So this has been a presentation for Holiday Hack Challenge 2019 in KumoCon. Thank you so much for, uh, for watching. And here's my slides and my demos and my contact information. Feel free to drop me a line about crypto about KringleCon, about Holly Hack, or about anything else. Thank you very much.